class was inspired based on some of my reading that I was doing last night. So um, I'm going to, the, the name of the class is called The Easy Yoke, The Light Burden. All right. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. So let's start with Matthew 11 and 28. The book of St. Matthew, chapter 11 and verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Right. So Christianity loves this. I remember Catholicism. Wasn't there like a song they used to sing with the Ultra Boys, Catholic Aquarium? It was like, uh, it, it was like this exact verse, I think. And it was like, oh. Because, <laughs> you know, they got the organ and stuff up there. And they, if you were Catholic, you know what I'm talking about. We were, we were raised Catholic. We went to Catholic school. Hey, even, you even went to Catholic high school for a couple years, uh, Captain. Yeah, Park. sure did, man. Yep. So, I mean, they're good schools because of the private funding, typically, as far as what they give you. Uh, but, you know, they're indoctrinating you in addition to, like, you know, Esau's, you know, history and everything else. They're hitting you up with the uh, Catholic stuff. But yep. uh, this was a hymn from them, right? And, and Catholicism brings this out a lot. But through our understanding in the scriptures, right, we understand that those who are labor and heavy laden, that's us. That's us, the Israelites. And we're going to touch just a little bit on that today because I'm going to show you the difference between a, a heavy burden and a hard yoke versus what Christ said when we get to verse 30, what is the easy yoke and the light burden in Christ, right? So let's read on, verse 29. Verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Right, so that he that burden, that heavy labor, that has to deal with our souls being weighed down, right? And as we progress in the class, you'll see that. And, and the main point that we're going to touch on today, the heavy burden is our captivity, is our trials and tribulations that the Most High brought upon us of our own doing, which was just and meet. This is very important as we go through the class that we understand that, that Yes, it's God that did these things to us, but it should never be done from a, from a point of finger pointing. And it should be done with a sense of accountability and saying, hey, I understand that, that what we, the, the punishment we're receiving is just. I don't know if I brought it out last week or it came across my reading. Uh, I got to look for it. I may have marked it. There's a scripture, and I might have mentioned this, that basically says our judgment uh, was not enough. So despite the tragedies that we've been through, despite the, uh, the horrors of our, our captivities, um, it, it basically said something to the effect that it, was, it still wasn't enough. The Most High was still merciful in all the tragedy and travesty that he put upon us, right? So we need to be mindful of that. It might have been in Ezra, because I, I just finished Ezra. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it, was. Yeah, it, it might have been in Ezra that I read that. And he basically, it might have been eight or nine. And he says that we, that we, it, it was not enough what he inflicted upon us. And, you know, Ezra was very vexed because of what was going on. And what, what prompted him to say that was that we were still um, dealing with other nations. As a matter of fact, let's read it real quick. I found it. I did highlight it. Ezra yep. 9 and 13. Yep, I got it. The book of Ezra chapter 9, verse 13. And after all that is come upon us for our evil deeds, and for our great trespass, seeing that our God has punished us less than our iniquities deserve and has given us such deliverance as this. So the Bible teaches us that God has punished us less than our iniquities deserve. We deserve a harsher punishment for everything. And if you, and if you think about how, how, how horrific it's been for us as a people and continues to be so, maybe not so much physically as far as, you know, the maiming and the torturing that we're getting, uh, but definitely psychologically and, and, and on our soul, it weighs on us. Um, considering that and thinking that, that's a pretty strong statement that Ezra read. And that's a real meek, humble spirit. So going back to what Christ said, right? Let's read 29 again. Matthew 11, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. Right, and, and Ezra fight. was as well. He says, I am meek and lowly in heart, right? And he said, you're going to take my yoke upon you, right? He goes, and learn of me. Take my yoke and learn of me. He says, because I am meek and lowly in heart. And then he says, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. So we need to acknowledge that it's not enough. Our punishment is less than what our iniquities deserve. But it does come, and that heavy burden does come 
as a result of our actions and the things that we've been through. Read verse 30. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Mm. So Christ said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I had a lot of thoughts about that. I stopped on that verse and I said, man, I got to meditate on this. I got to look on this. And, uh, and, and what is he really trying to say here? Because he says to take of his cup is heavy, right? Like to be hated of all men's, you know, how is that, how is that easy? And I said, I gotta, I gotta get to the bottom of what is this yoke and this burden. And I say this because when you think about it, he calls it those things. And there's a particular reason that he does, but it's not really burdensome. It's not really uh, a yoke. But he says, what is his yoke and what is his burden? So I'm going to ask your brothers, maybe some of y'all cooking with gas real quick. What's his yoke? What's his burden? So let's look up yoke. I'm going to define it. Okay. Look at that kitty with the glasses. All right. So obviously it's a physical thing, right? It says a wooden bar or frame by which two draft animals, right? And we think yokes. We think of yokes of iron, right? A frame fitted to a person's shoulders to carry a load in two equal portions, right? This is a yoke. And then you have some other definitions down here by three, and it says an oppressive agency, servitude, bondage, right? It says a tie or a link, marriage. So when we say the old ball and chain, right? And, and then you got a yoke with your wife, that's the, that's the real definition. It's not an insult, right? Your yoke, right? They said they consider it a marriage, right? Also, it can be used as a verb, right? To put a yoke, to join in with the yoke with somebody, right? But I want you to think of those definitions as we go through that. And then we're going to look up burden. Let's look up burden. And it says something that is carried, a load, right? And then it says something oppressive or worrisome. Something oppressive or worrisome, right? To load or oppress. To load or oppress. So think about those definitions, all right? And we're going to move on. Let's go to Sirach 33 and 26. Mm. And we're going to get a biblical definition of what a yoke does, right? What a yoke does. So we want Sirach 33, and let's start at 26. The book of Sirach, chapter 33, verse 26. A yoke and a collar do, do bow the neck. So are tortures and torments for an evil servant. Right. So the purpose of a yoke, right? Says so a yoke and collar is to bow the neck. A yoke is used to bow the neck. Let's jump up to verse 25 because it's important that you, you visualize these in order to get the full understanding of what Christ is speaking about. Right. So it says, uh, start at verse 25 now. So 33. Verse 25. If thou set thy servant to labor, thou shalt find a rest. But if thou let him go idle, he shall seek liberty. Right? So we have to be put to work, right? We're all servants of the Most High in Christ. And it says we must do labor, right? Remember the previous classes that we've gone over, I've been talking a lot about watch, pray, and work, right? Every man his own work. So it says that we must be put to work because if you're idle, right, you're going to seek liberty. Read on. A yoke and a collar do bow the neck, so are tor are tortures and torments for an evil servant. So now he's letting you know that in order to set us to labor, we need a yoke because if not, right, if it doesn't bow the neck, it says we get tortures and torments if you're an evil servant. That kind of goes into a little bit of when Paul was speaking in Romans 7, how he had not known uh, uh, sin unless the law told him thou shalt not covet. And he said that the law wrought in him all manner of concupiscence because it showed him how messed up he really was, right? And like uh, I'll often say, Paul Mooney, the comedian, has said, the commandments put a foot in your ass, right? So that's torment to an evil servant. And we were all evil servants at one time until we started to repent, right? So in order to counteract that, we need a yoke in order to deal with that properly. Read on. Send him to labor that he be not idle, for idleness teacheth much evil. Right. So we need that yoke of labor, that yoke of work, because idleness teacheth much evil. Idleness teaches much evil. So rock 40 and one. We're going to go into the difference between the burdens that we put on ourselves by our evil behaviors. It's important for us to understand that so that then we can contrast that with what Christ 
uh, easy yoke and light burden is compared to what we've been dealing with before Christ. Sirach 40 and 1. Sirach chapter 40, verse 1. Great travail is created for every man, and in heavy yoke is upon the sons of Adam. So every man, great travail is created for. All of us are going to go through stuff, right? Whatever it might be. But it says on the sons of Adam, there is a heavy yoke upon us, right? Come on. From the day that they go out of their mother's womb to the day that they return to the mother of all things. Right. So what is this yoke that it's speaking of? And don't raise your hand, right? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move it along, right? This particular yoke, that's what we need to understand. What is this great travail and this heavy yoke? Because a heavy yoke is not an easy yoke. That's not a light burden to bear. So obviously he's not talking about what Christ was saying. He's speaking about something else here in, in uh, Sirach, right? So let's go to Romans 8 and 33. Book of Romans chapter 8 and verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Right, so who's going to lay anything on us, Right. Who's going to say we're to blame, we're not to blame? It's God that justifies, meaning he's the one that will let you know whose fault it is and why, right? Come on. Who is he that condemn it? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Right, so we have to understand something. Who is he that condemneth? We know that it's God that condemns as well. So he uses the example of Christ. He goes, Christ died, but also he was risen again. So and he's at the right hand of God, and Christ makes intercession for us. Come on, re remember that part about intercession. Come on, read. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or, naked, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. So he's speaking of a lot of earthly tribulations, a lot of earthly heavy yokes there. And he says, is that going to separate you from the love of Christ who makes intercession for us? Come on. As it is written, for thy sake we are, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. He says we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Come on. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Right. So when Christ in Matthew 11 starts talking about those who are heavy laden, those who labor, those who soul need rest, it's letting you know that all these things that come upon us as a people, but that in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loves us. Right. Come on. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Come on. Nor height, nor death, or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And the point of what those burdens and that heavy yoke is, is 35. But what your mindset that you need to have is, is that there's relief. As we bear those type of burdens, there is relief. Like there's that proverbial light at the end of the tunnel. And that light is Christ who makes intercession for us. Meaning you, we don't go through those things. We haven't gone through those things in vain. It wasn't just because God wanted to please himself and go, ha ha, you know, I'm getting them for being evil. There was a means to an end in that. And we've gone over countless classes where it talks about that, how he actually created uh, uh, the what, what's known as the Garden of Eden, uh, for us to be immortal in, but we, we didn't cherish it. We didn't do right by it. He made us to be immortal, and then he had to change that, right? Ezra tells you that the gates were, were wide and, and open, and then they became narrow and straight because of Adam's transgression, because of our sin, right? So in Christ, we are liberated from all those heavy burdens, right? When you read verse 35, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword, those are heavy burdens. Those are heavy yokes, but in Christ, we don't have that heavy of a burden. We don't have that hard of a yoke, right? Be mindful of that. Let's get Isaiah 10 and 20. The book of Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 20. And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, but they shall stay upon the Lord 
the Holy One of Israel in truth. Right, so it's letting you know that there will be a day, there will be a time when that remnant of Israel, right, that we are escaped, it says, we will no more stay on him that smote him. Meaning our oppressors, looking to them, seeking uh, the shadow of Egypt to help us in these things, that Stockholm Syndrome. He goes, those days will go away, and instead, we're going to stay upon the Lord and the Holy One of Israel in truth. That's those of us who have taken these steps in repentance, who have heard the word and received it and are working to get it engrafted in us so that we may build up that earnest of the spirit. I gave a class on that one time, right? So that we know that we put our trust and our hope and our faith in that. This goes into that intercession that we just read in Romans 8. Read on. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. And For you're those... seeing that now in these last days. That's how you see so much of Israel waking up, right? Uh, uh, th there hasn't been a, a recent time where you can say that this much Israel is so publicly open about who we are and what we're doing and letting our light shine, right? So we're certainly moved into those last days. Come on. For though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, Yet a remnant of them shall return. So letting because you know, though we are so numerous, it is only a remnant that will return, right? That goes into the one-third and two-third, right? The one-third being them that will be sealed and redeemed, and two-thirds of our people being cut off. Come on. The consumption decreed shall overflow with righteousness. For, right, so for it the says Lord. for the Lord... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, didn't, I, I was reading verse 23. So he says, yet a remnant shall return and the consumption decreed shall overflow with righteousness. Come on. For the Lord God of hosts shall make a consumption even determined in the midst of all the land. Read on. Therefore, therefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. Now, what is he speaking about here? He is talking about captivity. He is using the Assyrians. He is using the Egyptians. This is that consumption that he's speaking of, that we were consumed by the enemy because of our transgressions in captivity. And throughout history, that's what the, the state of our people has been, captivity to captivity to captivity. That's when you read in Daniel and you see the, the vision of the statue. We've gone over that a bunch of times. Those are all the different captivities from the other nations that we've been under. So he's speaking here about captivity. Come on. For yet a very little while, and the indignation shall cease, and mine anger in their destruction. So he says, though it may seem like a long time for us, Yet a little while, right? That's like when in Habakkuk, where he says, though it tarry, wait for it, because it tarry not. He goes, yet a little while, and he says, a very little while, and the indignation shall cease. What indignation is he speaking about? What indignation is he speaking about? Book of Jeremiah, chapter 17, and verse 4. And though, I'm sorry. And thou, even thyself, shall discontinue from thine heritage. That That's I the consumption. That's the consumption that happened to us, right? Come on. And I will cause thee to serve thine enemies. I'm sorry. The part he says that I gave thee, that I gave thee. It's God who did that to us, right? Come on. And I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not. And you For will thee. serve your enemies. He said, I will cause you. Come on. For ye have kindled a fire in mine anger, which shall burn forever. Now, let's go back to where we were in Isaiah 20, because indignation is like a great wrath, right? A fiery anger against us. So Isaiah uh, 10 and 25. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 25. For yet a very little while, and the indignation shall cease, and mine anger in their destruction. Right, because he caused us to be discontinued. I like the one that you brought out, Sassin, us going into captivity because we kindled that anger in him, right? So it wasn't about the other nations hating us, right? In this particular verse, it was him being angry with us and he sent them against us, right? It's important that we understand that part of it, all right? Read on. And the Lord of hosts shall stir up a scourge for him according to the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. 
and as his rod was upon the sea, so shall he lift it up after the manner of Egypt. And actually, before I get into 26, you got to understand something. I want to I want to talk about 25 just a little bit more. The reason you know it's that it's his indignation is that he says that the indignation will cease and mine anger and their destruction. Is God ever not going to be angry at the other nations? No, his whole purpose is that he's waiting with long suffering to unleash destruction on them, right? So if you go by that and you say that he's talking about the other nation's indignation stopping, his indignation is never going to stop for them. And theirs is never going to stop for us. It's going to get worse in those, in those days. When they see that Christ and all the angels are black and that they're coming to redeem uh, uh, those who they, who they had in derision, you think that all of a sudden they're going to hate us less? No, they're going to be angry with us less. No, they're going to be more upset, right? But he says it is going to be, he's going to stir up a scourge for those other nations, just like it was at the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb, right? Um, when you have time, if you haven't done it, he's, he's talking about Gideon and when they defeated the Midianites, all right? Uh, in the book of Judges, you can read, I think, Judges 7 and 8, and it'll give you that history. So he's saying it's going to be like that. And he says, and as his rod was upon the sea, so shall he lift it up after the manner of Egypt. So he's talking about the Exodus as well, right? So he says, I'm going to do that as well. Okay, read on. It shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Right, and the anointing is Christ. The anointing is Christ. So he says it's going to come to pass that that yoke and all of that is going to come off of us, that these other nations have put on us of our own doing, right? But by the hand of God, like we read in Jeremiah 17 and 4, but he goes, because of the anointing, he goes, and that stuff will be taken off of us because that's that hard uh, burden. That's that heavy burden. That's that hard yoke that he's speaking about there, right? Let's get Isaiah 14 and 24. The book of Isaiah, chapter 14, verse 24. The Lord of hosts hath sworn, saying, Surely, as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. And, I, and as I have purpose, so shall it stand. Right, because he's God and he lies not. Read on. That I will break the Assyrian in my land, and upon my mountains tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off them and his burdens apart from off their shoulders. So there's different yokes, there's different burdens, right? And the, and the consumption and the hard burden is captivity, all right? That's the simple answer for it. Yes, there's more that goes with it as a result of captivity we couldn't read. As a result of captivity, we got forced into Christianity and all these other things, but it's speaking of the captivity, right? And he's saying that he's going to break the Assyrian and by breaking the Assyrian, right, and the Assyrian is symbolic basically, again, of all the other nations. That's why he's using that here, because we went different captivities, right? And at this time, we were out of the Assyrian uh, uh, captivity, right? And he says, and I will break the Assyrian in my land, and upon my mountains tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke, now he's talking about the yoke that the other nations put on us, depart from off them, and his burden depart from off their shoulder, Right? Remember, we read in Isaiah 10, it was talking about because of the anointing. Now, let's hold this. We're going to come back to Isaiah 14. Go to Luke 1, and we're going to read 68. St. Luke chapter 1, verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Meaning we have to be saved from something. What are we saved from? The scripture is plain on this, right? Read on. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hands of all that hate us. That we should be saved. That's the salvation. That's the salvation. The, uh, Christianity will teach you salvation from your sins. No, keeping the laws and in and, and, and the faith of Christ, that's what's going to save us from that. We need salvation from our enemies. Yes, we are under their subjection because of our sin, but we need salvation from our enemies because this is what we're reading up until this point. When he says 
uh, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, Isaiah is one of those, right? Jeremiah, all the different prophets, right? Some that we're going to touch on today, others that we've touched on. You read it all throughout the scriptures. That was always the promise from the beginning. And he says, we will be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. Read verse 72. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. Come on. The oath which he swore to our father Abraham that he would be that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. Go ahead. In holiness. In holiness and in righteousness before him all the days of our life. And that is the salvation. That is the anointing that we're speaking about. This is why those burdens need to depart off of our shoulder, that captivity. Let's go back to Isaiah 14 and read 25 again. We're going to go down through 27. Isaiah 14, verse 25. That I will break the Assyrian in my land and upon my mountain tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off them, and his burdens depart from off their shoulders. This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth, and this is the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations. So he mentions the Assyrians, but he's letting you know that God's hand, this is purposed upon all the earth, all these other nations that have ever done anything to us. He's going to break them so that we may serve him, as we read in Luke, without fear, in all holiness and in all righteousness. That's what Christ is redeeming us from, from captivity. So captivity is that heavy burden, right? Read verse 27. For the Lord of hosts hath purposed, and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? Right, so this is what God has determined, and there is nobody that's going to change that. Not your Christian pastor, not your, not your apologist, not your scholars and theologians that have gone to seminary school and have theologies degree. This is plain what God have purpose, and nobody will disannul it. This is why the scripture tells you in Romans 3, let God be true and every man a liar. Because the scriptures cannot be broken, and that will be the truth. Let me get Jeremiah 23 and 33. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 33. And when this people, or the prophet, or a priest shall ask thee, saying, What is the burden of the Lord? Thou shalt then say unto them, What burden? I will even forsake you, saith the Lord. Ah, so here's where, here's where I say it gets a little complicated and a little tricky. The burden of the Lord is not captivity. That is our burden. And as you read on, you'll see that. He brought it on us. It was the tool that he used against us for our punishment so that we can get right. But it is not his burden. The, the most I said, what burden? Like we read earlier in Ezra's when it said our punishment was not in us. What burden? Right? What burden? I will even forsake you, saith the Lord. Basically, don't you dare try to say this is my fault. That's what Adam was saying. It's the woman you gave me, Lord. Mm -hmm. Right? Read on. For as and as for the prophets and the priests and the people that shall say the burden of the Lord, I will even punish that man and his house. Mm, he says, you better not say the burden of the Lord. He said, I will punish that man in his house. So there's a difference between us saying God brought it on us from a perspective of blaming him and saying God brought it on us, understanding that it was of our own doing and by his hand, he brought it. So we're really the ones that brought it upon us when we make a statement like that, but it was by his hand that it was delivered, right? Read on. Thus shall you say every one to his neighbor and every one to his brother, what hath the Lord answered, and what hath the Lord spoken? Read on. And the burden of the Lord shall ye mention no more, for every man's word shall be his burden. Every man's word is his burden. Every man's word is his burden. Right? Read on. For ye have perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord of hosts, our God. Because we perverted his word. And uh, that perversion goes into a lot of things. It runs the gamut of changing the truth of the scriptures to a lie with all these pastors and everything. But it starts first with us by perverting it by our sinful behavior, by our turning away and not wanting that truth, right? Like you read in Isaiah 30 and it tells you prophesied the seats. Keep the Holy One of Israel away from us. 
our perversion. So it's our burden. It's not the Lord's burden. It's ours that we have brought upon us. This is why Christ, when we're going to start heading back in that direction a little bit, says that his burden is light, that his yoke is easy. And it was always easy. It was always simple what he required of us. Read on. Thus shalt thou say to the prophet, what hath the Lord answered thee? And what hath the Lord spoken? But since ye say the burden of the Lord, therefore thus saith the Lord, because ye say this, the burden of the Lord, and I have sent unto you, saying, ye shall not say the burden of the Lord. Come on. Therefore, behold, I, even I will utterly forget you, and I will forsake you, and the city that I gave you, and your fathers, and cast you out of my presence. Read on. And I will bring an everlasting reproach upon you, and a perpetual shame which shall not be forgotten. And this is where it leads us to today. And this is what happened to us because we were blaming God, our forefathers, right? We were blaming God for this. He said, I'm going to forget you. Basically, I am going to cast you out. Now we know the scripture tells you he didn't really forget us, right? But it says that we will go many years, right? Without an image, without an ephod, without a king. He's talking about that discontinuation from our heritage, like we read in Jeremiah 17 and 4. And he hey, says, Jack, and I, yeah. That's why he says, I will go and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense. Uh -huh. Until we can own up to our own shortcomings and not blame the most high. Because just like any good father, he's just going to chastise and punish his children for their disobedience. Absolutely. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Let's go to Deuteronomy 28 and 37, because he says that we would be a reproach and we would have a perpetual shame, right? This is the curses. And he says it'll not be forgotten. This is why I tell you, when we read early in Isaiah 10, it's not the heathen's indignation that's going to cease. They're going to hate us more, right? Because it said it'll not be forgotten, right? Come on. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 37. And thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations, whether the Lord shall lead thee. Right? That's that astonishment, that proverb, and that byword. It says, among all nations, whither the Lord shall lead us. That's that reproach. That's all the derogatory names for us. That's us being called outside of our real names. Right? Being called by our slave's master's name, Thompson, Smith, Gonzalez, Rodriguez. All of that, Right? Let's go to Tobit, three and one. Tobit was a smart brother, Northern Kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> now, golly. <laughs> uh, the book of Tobit, chapter three, verse one. Then I being grieved did weep, and in my sorrow prayed, saying, O Lord, thou art just and all thy works, and all thy ways are mercy and truth, and thou, and thou judgest truly and justly forever. Right, remember we read earlier, there was a scripture that was talking about his judgment, right? And his was just. Uh, I believe when we read in Romans 8, and they said, who's going to say this, right? It's him that judges, it's him that discerns. And Tobit is letting you know, he says, listen, all his ways are mercy and truth. All his ways. Remember, Ezra said our punishments was not enough for the sins that we did. It, it was not meat. It wasn't sufficient for what we did. And that's a heavy statement because the, the yoke that we deal with as a result of our actions, but going into that mindset of not blaming it on the Lord, don't say that it's the burden of the Lord. It's our burden that we brought on ourselves, right? Don't even say, damn, that's the white man's fault. You know what? Yeah, he's the, he's the main emissary of Satan, but it's because of us that he's allowed to do the things that he does to us. So we must never forget that so that we can put ourselves back in that frame of mind to get back to it. Tobit understood this. And he says, and your judgments and your ways are mercy and truth. And thou judgest truly and just forever. Read on. Remember me and look on me. Punish me not for my sins and ignorances and the sins of my fathers who have sinned before thee. And I've said this for a long time that when you're doing your prayers, don't forget to ask for forgiveness for the sins of your forefathers. Right? Because through the regeneration, guess what? You're, some of us are them. And it's because of their sins that we're in the conditions that we're in today. And their sins are our sins, right? And see how the circle, nothing new under the sun? Come on. For they obeyed not thy commandments. Wherefore thou hast delivered us for a spoil. And there Tobit says it plainly. 
the result of it was us not obeying his commandments. And because of that, God has delivered us for a spoil. Now, mind you, notice that he started when he said this, that even though that was the case, that was just. Because some people will sit there and go, oh, well, I don't like the parts where God talks about this destruction. And I don't like the parts about this. I'm down with us being Israel. I'm like, listen, it don't matter what the hell you like. You better get on board and realize that that is just whatever God says. You better start liking it because that's God's way. So you better build your spirit up to that point where you understand that. Because to say this, to say that you're an Israelite, to start keeping his commandments, is saying you agree with everything God says. Because anything less than that, any, anything less than 100% compliance means you're a rebel. And God's not dealing with rebels. Read on. And unto captivity and unto death and for a proverb of reproach to all the nations among whom we are dispersed. He just read that in Deuteronomy 28, 37. What does that tell you? That Tobit was learned in the scriptures. He understood. Because if you don't know where you're coming from, you're doomed to repeat the mistakes of your past. You can't know where you're headed or what you're doing or where you're going. So we got to stop being in our feelings about it and realize that his ways are not ours. His thoughts are higher than ours. So it takes a higher mind for him to say what he says about the other nations and embrace that and accept that and not let the world tell you that that's hatred or hate speech. That's what God says. So you need to work it out within yourself. Do you Are you going to be on board with God's program? Or are you going to feel a way about some of what he says? Ah, I'm down with most of what he says, but I don't think this and I don't think that. You really think you're going to make it that way? Read on. And now thy judgments are many and true. Deal with me according to my sins and my fathers. Wow, what a damn. Let me tell you, that's heavy, bro. Tobit, Tobit got cojones, bro. That's some balls. I'm sorry, there's no other way to put it. His loins are girded up. I'll put it that way. Hmm. To tell God to deal with me according to my sins and my fathers. Saying, yes, thank you, sir. May I have another? Because it's just. He says... All that death, all that delivering unto captivity, he goes, those judgments, they are many and they are true, God. So deal with me according to my sins and my father's. Come on. Because we have not kept thy commandments, neither have walked in truth before thee. Read on. Now, therefore, deal with me as seemeth best unto thee. Man, talk about faith. Talk about faith. God, you deal with me as you seem best. Not to say that you don't, you can't entreat for mercy, but hey, you know what? I know you're going to judge the way you need to judge regardless. And I accept that, God. Come on. And command my spirit to be taken from me, that I may be dissolved and become earth. For it is profitable for me to die rather than to live, because I have heard false reproaches and have much sorrow. Command, therefore, that I may now be delivered out of this distress and go into the everlasting place. Turn not thy face away from me. You know what else Tobit understood by that statement? That this was not his rest. He said, you know what? If you want to take me, I, it's, it's deserve it. It's just. And just don't take your presence away from me. You want to put me in that place? You want to take me and put me in the ground? Then go ahead and do it if that's the judgment that you think is fit. And guess what? If not, if you want me to stay here and be here, then let me stay here and be here, right? And continue doing what we need to do. Watch this. We're going to read a bunch now in Baruch, all right? So we're going to read all of Baruch chapter 2. I'll try not to stop only as much as I need to, all right? Baruch chapter 2. Because I wanted to stop at certain points, but I said, man, this is this is too good. Like, you know, like, can't give him a sample. I got to give him the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Baruch chapter 2, one. Therefore the Lord hath made good his word which he pronounced against us and against our judges that judged Israel and against our kings and our princes and against the men of Israel and Judah to bring upon us great plagues such as never happened under the whole heaven. And you know and what that what he's saying has never happened under the whole heaven? That's like what we read in Daniel a few weeks back where it says unto us, what's happened to us is not like anybody on the families of the earth. What we've dealt with and what we've done with. And he says... God had made good on his word to those things. Come on. As it came to pass in Jerusalem, according to the things that were written in the law of Moses, that a man should eat the flesh of his own son and the flesh of his own daughter. And he's talking about the siege in Jerusalem in 70 AD, right? So he's letting you know, listen, this is a, 
the vibe at that, so there's the creep. This is like the time travel in like Avengers, right? It's like sometimes these visions and this stuff is written. Uh, the Bible's not chronologically placed, all the books of the Bible, all right? So understand that. We shove the Apocrypha, like, in the middle, but it's, it's uh, unless you're dealing with, like, really the Maccabees, right, for the most part, the Maccabees is the part that's kind of directly preceding uh, the Roman captivity because it deals with the Greek. But the Apocrypha has um, the Babylonian, right? It also has the Persian Median, okay? It has the Greek captivity. So you see different things in there. So as the visions come and go, it's letting you know that uh, these prophecies uh, didn't fail and they came to pass, right? Come on. Moreover, he had delivered them to be in subjection to all the kingdoms that are around about us, to be as a reproach and desolation among all the people round about, where the Lord has scattered them. Thus we were cast down and not exalted because we have sinned against the Lord our God and have not been obedient unto his voice. And you got to make sure that you understand verse 5. We were cast down and not exalted as we should have been, because we've sinned against him, and we have not been obedient unto his voice. Go ahead. To the Lord our God appertaineth righteousness, but unto us and to our fathers open shame, as appeareth this day. For all the plagues are come upon us, which the Lord hath pronounced against us, Yet have we not prayed before the Lord that we might turn everyone from the imaginations of his wicked hearts. Wherefore the Lord watched over us for evil, and the Lord hath brought it upon us. For the Lord is righteous in all his works, which he hath commanded us. Right, so he yet, says, even though all these things, we have yet to fully come to repentance as a people. And because of that, God has watched over us for the evil. So even though he said, I would turn and I would forget you, this is what I'm saying. He didn't really forget us. He just didn't, he, for, he wasn't going to deal with us in the loving way until the lesson was taught and we acknowledge that we've learned that lesson, right? Go ahead. Verse 10, yet we have not hearkened unto his voice to walk in the commandment of the Lord that he has set before us. And now, O Lord God of Israel, that has brought thy people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and high arm and with signs and with wonders, and with great power, and has gotten thyself a name, as appeareth this day. O Lord our God, we have sinned, we have done ungodly, we have dealt unrighteously in all thine ordinances. Let thy wrath turn from us, for we are but a few left among the heathen, where thou hast scattered us. Right now, and at that time it was a few, right? So that's what he means, we are but a few that were scattered among the heathen. But, um... I'm always speaking about, you can look through the scriptures for inspiration on how to pray better and different things. And I'm always talking about how this acknowledgement, boy, one of the biggest things and the first steps to getting over anything where you fall short is to acknowledge that you have a problem to begin with. And he was very on point in what he was entreating the Lord for here. Because he said, hey, we've sinned, we've done ungodly, and we've dealt unrighteously in all thine ordinances. That's a humble, that's a meek spirit. Right. And let me tell you, you know how sometimes like psychologically they'll have you do stuff like that and you'll hear things like, oh, it's so liberating to get that off my chest. It was so mm -hmm. I couldn't wait to just, man, you know, I'm, I know that I'm going to be judged for this, that and the other. But it feels good not to hold that in and, and, and hide that anymore and acknowledge that spiritually. We need to do that with the most high. Right. It also says that we should confess faults one to another. So, you know, I mean, we had an incident with a brother last week and he was getting all out the spirit or whatever. Brothers kept on him, kept on him. All praise to the most high. He came to his sense. And he, you know what? I was. I was being like this and I was being like that and I got defensive. That's good. But you got to stay with that spirit so that you don't keep moving forward into those mistakes. At some point, you got you to gotta let that be your guiding light so that you don't continue to, to point blame elsewhere. It's uh, one of the most notorious things that, that, that we're known for is passing the buck. Not taking accountability for where we did things wrong and what we could do better. Go ahead. Verse 14. Hear our prayers, O Lord, and our petitions, and deliver us from thy, for thine own sake, and give us favor in the sight of them which have led us away, that all the earth may know that thou art the Lord our God, because Israel and his prosperity is called by thy name. O Lord, look down from thy holy house and consider us, Bow down thine ear, O Lord, to hear us. Open thine eyes and behold, for the dead that are in the graves, whose souls are taken from their bodies, will give unto the Lord neither praise nor righteousness. 
But the soul that is greatly vexed, which goeth stooping and feeble, and the eyes that fail, and the, and the hungry soul, will give thee praise and righteousness, O Lord. Because when do we really turn to God? When do we really give praises to the Most High? When we go into trouble, right? This is why he says, a broken and contrite spirit he will not despise. It, that's when it's like, oh, Lord, I need you. Things are rough. God's going to prevail. But when things are going good in our lives, very rarely do we give any type of credence. At the most, you're going to give a God is good all the time. That's the most that you're going to give, right? But for the most part, when do you see God? In times of trouble and in times of affliction. And he's letting you know, listen, that's not wrong. So long as it brings you that good fruit where you stay on that. You can't be going between this back and forth of only when things are bad that you deal with God, right? Come on. Therefore, we do not make our humble supplication before thee, O Lord our God, for the righteousness of our fathers and of our kings. For thou hast sent out thy wrath and indignation upon us, and thou hast spoken by thy servants the prophets, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Bow down your shoulders to serve the king of Babylon. So shall ye remain in the land that I gave unto your fathers. But if you will not hear the voice of the Lord to serve the king of Babylon, I will, I will cause to cease out of the cities of Judah and from without Jerusalem the voice of mirth and the voice of joy and the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride and the whole land shall be desolate of inhabitants. So he's basically saying, don't try to resist the captivities, right? I'm giving you that as punishment. You need to learn from them. I'm telling you, you're going to bow down and you're going to serve Babylon. I'm telling you, you're going to bow down and you're going to serve Assyria and all these other captivities that we're in. Today, in these last days, I did the class, Spiritually Babylon. It's talking about the United States, starting with them and the current environment that we live in. Come on. But we should not hearken unto thy voice to serve the king of Babylon. Therefore, hast thou made good the words that thou spakest by thy servants, the prophets, namely, that the bones of our kings and the bones of our fathers should be taken out of their places. And that's going into us being forgotten. You ever hear how they say there's no archaeological evidence yep. uh, for some of the stuff that we say? Like it's not true and whatever. That was the Lord's by design. So he covers every base. Because some people well, where's the archaeology of your great kingdoms? Where's this? God punished us and jacked us up so much. And it still wasn't enough, according to Ezra. That, that we were forgotten. That's what it means to be hidden ones. That's why it's that mockery. That's why it's that laughter. Let me tell you, if there was overwhelming archaeological evidence that, that we were the Israelites, it, it, then the, the salvation wouldn't be necessary. These people would, some of them would try to get themselves together to, to say, hey, let me do this, right? But God has a plan that way he wants this thing. That, for that wisdom of Solomon 5 to be fulfilled, that means until the last day, they will never accept us. So don't get excited when you see other nations on YouTube saying you are the Israelites. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, we've done wrong. Don't be excited when they say they should pay reparations and they acknowledge all the different things that they did. That's nothing. That's just them trying to lull you to sleep. All right? Come on. Verse 25. And lo, they are cast out of the heat of the day and to the frost of the night. And they died in great miseries by famine, by sword, and by pestilence. And the house which is called by thy name hast thou laid waste, as it is to be seen this day, for the wickedness of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah. O Lord our God. Thou hey, you saw that, right? He said Israel and Judah. Judah like to be Judah. We, we wicked together. We wicked together. So stop. <laughs> You're not more righteous. <laughs> Good treacherous, <day>. treacherous Judah. <laughs> treacherous Judah, the Bible says. Treacherous. Come on. <laughs> O oh Lord, our God, thou hast dealt with us after all thy goodness and according to all that great mercy. Hey, God. he says all that death and destruction and that captivity, Lord, you dealt out of goodness with us. Oof. Hey, that's a strong spirit to say that. That's what I'm saying. That's that thank you, sir. May I have another? Like, mm -hmm. like to not feel a way about the conditions that we're in. That's a strong spirit to, to really acknowledge your faults. That's a level of humility, man, that I think a lot of us still need to strive to and, and like to really take ownership of, of how we are and who we are. Come on. As thou spakest by thy servant Moses in the day when thou didst command him to write thy law before the children of Israel, saying, If ye will not hear my voice, surely this very great multitude shall be turned unto a small number among the nations where I will scatter them. Hey, you want to know what's heavy? You got people who say, ah, the Apocrypha, that's not part of the Bible. Why is he referencing Deuteronomy 28 right now? 
Because mm -hmm. that's what he's talking about when he said when Moses said that. So it's not part of the body. You know, they say it's not canon. Be quiet, man. That's that's all crafty devices and crafty counsels. You know, you got to let the spirit guide you. And the spirit can't guide you unless you start keeping his laws. Come on. For I knew that they would not hear me because it is a stiff-necked people. But in the land of their captivities, they shall remember themselves hmm. and shall know that I am the Lord their God. For I will give them in heart and ears to hear. And that goes to show you that the heart is not dealing with the organ. The ears is not dealing with the organ. That is spiritual when you read that throughout the scriptures. Because he's saying, I will give you a heart and ears. We weren't walking around without a heart to pump blood and ears to hear our environment, right? So he's letting you know, I'm going to get your mind right. And I'm going to get your, your, your spirit right to hear me and apply. Come on. And they shall praise me in the land of their captivity and think upon my name and return from their stiff neck and from their wicked deeds. For they shall remember the way of their fathers which sinned before the Lord. And that's why it's so important. We can never forget even just that alone from a historical perspective. I know we like to look at the history of the mightiness of our forefathers, which is great because we're great people. We're the best people on the earth. But we need to be able to look at that and say, hey, we also were evil as hell. And, and we deserve everything that's come upon us. Come on. And I will bring them again into the land which I promised with an oath unto their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they shall be lords of it. And I will increase them, and they shall not be diminished. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them to be their God, and they shall be my people. And I will no more drive my people of Israel out of the land that I have given them. Mm-mm-mm. Baruch, Baruch is another heavy book, man. Y'all need, yes, need to get up on that. Baruch is another heavy book. Tobit is strong. Baruch is strong, right? So we've dealt with the burden as far as captivity. But then there's a lot of talk about sin, right? So let's go into Psalms 38 and 1. And real briefly, we're going to talk about the other burden, which is the sin itself. Remember I said earlier how in Romans 7, when Paul says that the law wrought or manner of evil concupiscence in him because it basically magnified what was wrong with him, right? So let's get Psalms 38 and let's start at one. The book of Psalms, chapter 38, verse one. O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither cast in me in thy hot displeasure. For thine arrow stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. Mm, so remember, it says those who labor and need rest. We read in Matthew, uh, right? We're going to go back to that uh, after two more scriptures. And it says, there is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. Meaning we need those spiritual ears. We need that spiritual heart in order to get ourselves into a sound mind, right? And he says, neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. The burden of our sin is another heavy burden, is another heavy yoke. Come on, read. For mine iniquities are gone over mine head, and in heavy burden they are too heavy for me. He says, so my iniquities is the heavy burden. My sins is the heavy burden. All of us have that. When the scripture talks about the crosses that we have to bear, remember when um, Paul was saying he entreated Christ to take his sin from him, and he said, hey, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it, but he says, uh, uh, basically my strength is magnified in weakness. You being able to overcome that by, by the understanding that you have in me is going to show how much more powerful my promises and my mercy is. So he's like, no, I'm not going to take it from you. And part of what I was going to go over, I don't know if I'm touching on it today. I don't remember what the scriptures that I left. I think I'm not. And why, that's why I said, I can't go over the stuff that I want to go over in Ezra's is that it gets real heavy because there's parts in Ezra's where he talks about um, how we're going to be changed, like to not be able to sin. And I know I've mentioned this before, but I've never really gone into it with scriptures where it talks about when, when, when that time comes, right? Cause to say that you want the kingdom is to say that you want Christ to return, right? Because the kingdom comes with him. There's no kingdom without him. So what you're saying is Christ come back when you say that you want the kingdom, right? Have, have the, thy kingdom come. You're saying Christ come when you say thy kingdom come. And when he comes, the, uh, when you read in Ezra, uh, it talks about how it's going, it literally says what, what, what I sometimes will say in passing, how he's going to change us where, where we're not going to have a choice to sin. And 
it goes to show you that he's always had that authority for us to basically, that goes into like the free will stuff to basically say, no, the thing is he wants us to choose to do this. He wants us to choose to acknowledge his ways. And that's where the free will comes in because people talk about the predestination. So does that mean I'm going to repent anyway? Uh, no, that's why the scripture says make your calling and election sure, right? But if he needs to nudge something and put something in front of you, he knows the spirits that are there with you. The point is, is that those that are predestinated, when it's that last go around, trust me, those will repent. But in between there, it's fair game. You might have lives where you did it and then you come back as, you know, crippled or blind like you read in John, right? Uh, was it John 9 where he says, what did he do to be born blind? What did him and his parents do? And there's a mm -hmm. bunch of other scriptures that go into that. But um, circling back to this, you have to understand that the, the heavy burden is going into the sins. The heavy burden is captivity. The heavy yoke is captivity. And it's a result of our sins. Our iniquities is that heavy burden that's tough for us to bear. That's what puts us in a position of not being able to, to rest and, and labor, right? Let's get Galatians 5 and 1. The book of Galatians, chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, this yoke of bondage is uh, definitely talking about the sacrificial law, right? It's talking about the yoke of bondage of the sacrificial law. But when it deals with the liberty that's in Christ, we're going to start to segue back into understanding what is that easy yoke, what is that light burden that he's speaking about. And but the, with, with that um, bondage comes all the different things that are there, right? So he's talking about the sacrificial law, but was not with grace under Christ. And that's the liberty that we have with him to fix those things. So that basically the Most High is not going to put us back in a situation like when we were in uh, the 1600s in captivity and the 1400s under the conquistadors, under the Babylonian and all of that. Now that, now that Christ has, has come and this word is coming back mightier in the earth, our, our captivity is a different type and it's more spiritual, right? It's that spiritual wickedness in high places. It's not that physical yokes that we're dealing with anymore. Now, let's go back to Matthew 11. It's still captivity, though. Make no mistake about it. Subject to payments. St. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Right. And what do we labor? We labor in this captivity. We, we are heavy laden because of our sins. Right? Come on. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. And he says, so I need you to take my yoke upon you. Because we have a yoke already. We have a heavy burden already on what we're dealing with as a result of our iniquities. Let's get John 13, 15. We're going to come back to Matthew. St. John chapter 13, verse 15. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Now, back to Matthew 11 and 29. He said, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. Matthew 11, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. He's saying that to take his yoke upon him is to learn from him, to do as he did, to follow what he did, because that's a lot easier than all the laws, statutes, and commandments that are there written out with the sacrificial lambs and animals that had to be given to it. Right? Remember, he came to magnify the law. He came to show us a, a, a better way to keep it, not do away with it, right? Read on. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. First John 5 and 1. First John chapter 5 and verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. Right, so we say we love Jesus, we love Christ, right? So he's going to expound upon that love. Come on. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. Right, come on. For this is the love of God, 
that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. And I know this is one of the basic scriptures that we give to brothers. This is one of the first scriptures you probably ever hear in a circle or in a group or in a preset, right? So I know um, one of the brothers brought this verse out early. I think it was Eleazar, right? But we had to go all the way around the block before you just go straight here to understand what he's saying, right? So part of that easy yoke and that easy and that light burden is basically really i'm gonna I'm, we're gonna go through some more scriptures so you fully understand it right but to summarize it it's basically being humble and meek like he was to learn to keep these laws not resist them in the faith of his salvation which is what we read in luke one right that's what his salvation is for under this grace period under this mercy that we have under him he's saying you didn't want to keep the laws and you resisted the holy ghost like it talks about in Acts seven and look at all that came upon you as a result of that. So this is why his yoke and his burden is easy because to keep the law should not be hard. You know, it's, it's not hard work. This is, this is love. This is, this is passion, what we do. And we should feel that way and it should never feel burdensome. We should never feel distressed about it. His commandments are not grievous. So going back to all the brothers that gave different answers, I said, yeah, I said, the closest I'll say is your answers were incomplete right? Because there's more that goes to it. And I have several more scriptures that we're going to deal with it, right? So he says, uh, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Come on. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. That's the victory that overcometh the world. Our faith in Christ coming to redeem us. That's how we overcome the world. Come on. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the son of God. That's the one that overcomes the world. That's the way you combat these things. That's the way you combat that heavy, that heavy burden, right? That heavy laden, like he says, those of us who labor and are heavy laden. It's not just he comes and that's it. And that stuff is done away with. There's work that we have to do to get there. And it revolves around getting ourselves set in these commandments. Let's get second John six. Remember in John 13, 15, he said, do what I did as I did. As I did unto you, you need to do. Come on. Second John, verse 6. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. So nothing's ever changed. This is not a new thing. He says, love is that we walk after his commandment. Do like he did. Walk after his commandment. John 14, 15. Saint John, chapter 14, and verse 15. If ye love me, Keep my commandments. He says, if ye love me, keep my commandments. That's what a covenant is. A covenant is a contract, meaning something is required on both ends. And he requires our love. But love is an actionable thing. We're too used to just saying it as a word. We think it is a feeling. Love is an action thing. It's actionable. And he says, if ye love me, keep my commandments. Not praise my name, not do all this. All that falls under that. But he says, if ye love me, keep my commandments. Let's get Micah 6 and 8. Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. He that showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. Right? So he have shown us, Christ have shown us. And it says, O man, what is good? And what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. Sirach 51 and 26. Almost done. Got a few more scriptures. You said 51, Cap? Yeah, 51 <clears throat> and 26. The book of Sirach, chapter 51, verse 26. Put your neck under the yoke and let your soul receive instruction. She is hard at hand to find. The yoke of instruction is that light yoke that Christ is speaking about. John 13, 15, um, 1 John, 2 John, John 14, 15, Micah, and now Sirach. 51, 26, he says, my yoke is uh, easy because it is the yoke of instruction. He says, put your neck under the yoke. We're going to put it under Christ's yoke. And he says, and let your soul receive instruction. Notice he said, I, I'm, I'm humble and meek before you. He says, so let your soul receive instruction because instruction 
She is hard at hand to find. This proper understanding, none of us had it until whatever it was, that small circumstance that may seem coincidental, which was not. Captain Aparim says that a lot when you see him in camp and stuff like that. It's not a coincidence that you're here. It's not a coincidence that you received this word. What you do with it, that's up to you after that. But the fact that you hear it and you received it, and all praises for those of us that took action on it, which is what? Everybody on this chat right now. Everybody that's with IUIC. It is hard to find. It's like Sirach 3. What does it say? More things are shown unto you than men understand. It is hard to find. This wisdom is hidden. That's the mystery of it. Right? Come on, read. Behold with your eyes how that I have had but little labor and have gotten unto me much rest. Because... Yeah, we work hard as far as pushing the truth, but in the work of keeping the commandments in the faith that is Christ and his salvation that he'll bring, that's not hard work. So that's where he says, my burden is not heavy. It's light work to keep the commandments. The commandments are not hard to keep. That used to be one of the questions we would get sometimes. Hey, is it, was it hard for you to repent? And, and, what, and yeah, some others will say, well, yeah, I had this that I was dealing in with that. But as far as keeping the law, keeping the laws are not hard. You know what makes it hard? Your pride and your ego and your stiff neckness because you have not developed that sober mind and that humble spirit. The laws are not hard to keep, not at all, not by a long shot. The Sabbath is easy to keep. The dietary law is easy to keep. And I'm not talking about the tricksy stuff that they try to throw in your food. That's prophesized too, right? You're going to eat that defiled bread. But it's easy to read a label and say, oh, okay, this has something that I shouldn't have. You know what makes it hard? When you start to overcomplicate stuff. Well, they cook in the grill, and then they do this, and then they do that. Remember, I've gone through this extreme. Then don't eat out. Don't eat out. Because trust me, the place is cooking pork and unlawful stuff on the same place. Even if you go to a place that's organic and free range and everything, if they sell shrimp or something like that that's unlawful, they're cooking it on the same grill. You're going to get all up in arms about it. So I'm saying it's easy. It's easy. This is what's cleansed. This is what isn't. You don't got to make it more complicated for you. You don't got to start looking and say, well, this chemical is made from duck feathers. Right? Because that was the one that was going around for a while with, with the L-cysteine. That's duck feathers. That's duck feathers. Oh, you can't eat seaweed. You can't eat seaweed. So many duck. Why are you making it hard? It's easy, the understanding in Christ. Come on, read. Verse 28, get learning with a great sum of money and get much gold by her. And it's not talking about real money, right? It's just using that example. Come on. Let your soul rejoice in his mercy and be not ashamed of his praise. And we got to rejoice in his mercy, right? Acknowledging what? That what we've gone through is it, it was not meat. It was not just for everything that we've did. And the mercy that even through all that, we're still here today. And this word is alive and in us today with this chance for us to repent by Christ's sacrifice. Come on. Work your work betimes. And in his time, he will give you your reward. Work that work betimes. That, you know what that means? As it was your way to go into sin, seek ye him 10 times more as you come into this. Because it's not hard work. In the scheme of things, it's not hard work. Is it laborious because of the effort that we have to put forth as far as teaching and putting this forth? Yes, that's one thing. But as far as to make your calling and election sure, it really isn't that hard. You make it hard for yourself. It's not that challenging. Let's get Ecclesiastes 12 and 13. Real simple to understand. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. It's that simple. We make it more complicated with all the nonsense. 5G. Oh! <laughs> seaweed. Oh! Oh! Uh, the, 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 the Sabbath starts during the day. Wait a second. The Sabbath is done away with. Wait a second. You can't get the lamb. Oh, we don't know who the Levites are making things harder than they got to be the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we make it a stumbling block because of our own lusts, our own faults within us. Read on verse 14. Verse 14. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, 
whether it be good or whether it be evil. God is going to judge good and evil. So we need to fear him and keep his commandments. That's our whole duty. That's a, that's easy. That's an easy mission statement. That's an easy mission statement. This is what Christ is talking about when he says, my yoke is uh, easy and my burden is light. So put it on. It's the yoke of instruction. Allow yourself to be learned. Stop trying to push against it. Let's get 2 Corinthians 5 and 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of, of God. The earthly and house he's talking about is your physical body, how we look and how we are now, right? Come on. He we says, have a building. If it was dissolved, it's not like your, your soul is not going to have anywhere to go. You have a building with God. Come on. In house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Right, because all spirits return back to the source, to the Father. Come on. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. So I've often made reference to, but I've not really gone too heavy into the scriptures. Maybe one time I think I did a class where we touched on this a little bit. It says, uh, I'll say something like, we're prisoners in this physical form. Like this isn't our full capability, right? And that means the fitters of us, those of us who are athletic and think we're this, that, and the other, that's nothing. It says we groan. It says, for in this we groan, that we earnestly desire to be clothed with our house, which is from heaven. We want our true godly form, not this earthly form. So this, when it says we groan, this is that struggle. We're, pri we're in prison inside this earthly house. Come on. If so, be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Right, because <clears throat> with your earthly vessel, you can be found naked, right? which we were when we were in sin, when we were out there without the laws, because that's what nakedness is, right? Without the laws for that covering. But when that kingdom comes and we have that other, that other manifestation of us, and we're not going to be able to even think about sin, right? We're going to always do right. It says, that's why we yearn for that. So it goes, and when we're clothed with that, with that heavenly, we won't be found naked ever, right? Come on. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened we are burdened because why we are born in sin carnal in the flesh come on not for that we would be unclothed but cloth upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life mortality being swallowed up of life is saying that that's going into that year of god's where you will die like men we want this mortality this short 70 by reason of strength, 80 years that we're given in this life, in this earthly tabernacle, right? We want that immortality. Mortality is swallowed up by life, right? Because mortality means to be mortal, to not be able to make it. It says it's swallowed up by life. He's talking about that immortality that was promised to us from the beginning, how the whole earth was made for us. He says, this is what we desire and we groan. We are burdened. This is Galatians 5, 17. I said, y'all know me by now. That's another one of my favorites. I, I, I look for every opportunity to bring that scripture out. It says, the spirit and the flesh are contrary one to another. And these two war. And they will until what? We are clothed with that immortality. Come on, verse 5. Now he that ha hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the spirit. And I went over this whole class. That's that earnest of the spirit, that our sincere desire should be on that, right? Come on, we're seeking a kingdom in a country. We're going to go down to verse 10. Read on. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Come on. For we walk by faith, not by sight. And what he means by absent from the Lord is that we're not in his presence in the kingdom. So while he says, while, uh, therefore, we're always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we reside in this body, we are absent from the Lord, but we walk by faith, not by sight. Come on. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. This is when Tobit was saying, kill me. If you find it meet, then go ahead and pass that judgment. Not saying that we should go and wish for death and try to kill ourselves, but he's saying we shouldn't fear it. And we should, because if you, if you put on the easy yoke, if you let yourself receive instruction and you receive that light burden, when the time comes for us to be called out of this vessel, because that's all it is, that's all death is, is the death of this earthly tabernacle. 
all spirits, whether they've repented or not, go back to the source. They go back to the Father. But those of us who have done righteously and have done right, we know that there's a reward for us. So you have to endure in this till Christ returns or until you get re until you die and then you get regenerated if it so be the Lord's will. And guess what? You come back, you do it all over. But he says, we have confidence that even though we're, we're absent, we know what's in store for us, right? Come on. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. All right, and this is that labor. I've gone over this through various classes over the weeks. We want to be accepted of him, right? Presenting ourselves holy, a living sacrifice unto him. Come on. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We all that, have to appear before the judgment seat. Come on. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. We just read that same thing in Ecclesiastes 12, 14 about how he's going to do judgment, good or bad. So what is, what is our confidence? Our confidence is that if we fear God and keep his commandments, understanding that that's that easy yoke, that light burden that Christ is telling us, receiving that instruction, keeping those commandments, that we know that what is just, whether it's good or bad, will be done. That God is not an unjust judge. So if you did bad, guess what? Your punishment is going to be worthwhile. And the things you did good, your reward is going to be worthwhile. Having that confidence. Boy, that's such an easy way to live. You don't have any fear that way. I messed up, and I know that I'm going to have things to pay for for the things that I messed up in. But you know what? I also know I put some good things in. And whatever God decides is me. Why worry about things you can't control? Just know that the judgment is coming. You can't control it. You can only control what you do day to day in this earthly tabernacle. Let me get Philippians 4 and 3. Philippians chapter 4, verse 3. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow. Ah, so now he says, he calls us a yoke fellow, a yoke fellow. Because why? We're yoked in Christ, right? He calls us fellow prisoners, right? In, in other letters, he says, my true yoke fellow, because you've taken on the yoke that Christ is speaking about. You've taken on his yoke, his easy, bur his easy burden. Put on his yoke and receive instruction. He says, and I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow. Come on. Help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Mm, come on. Rejoice in the Lord always. And, and again, I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Your moderation is your light shining, showing these scriptures. That's your moderation. Come on. Be careful for nothing. Meaning don't but, worry. Don't be so worried. Right? Come on. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. So whatever you're going through, whatever you're dealing with, don't worry about it. Just speak to the Most High about it. And let your request be known unto him with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. Come on. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That peace that God provides, it cannot be explained. It says it passes all understanding. It's not some, right? Somebody might, you might have somebody that's going through some mourning. You might have somebody that's going through some hard times with income or whatever it might be. And, and in that moment, you might feel, and it's carnal, that feeling, that the scriptures are not enough. That, that casting your cares upon him, like it says, is not enough. But he tells you, listen, just stick to this. Stick to this program. Follow my instruction. Stay, be, be my yoke fellow in this. And trust me, that peace of God is going to come upon you, and it's unexplainable. It's beyond understanding the peace that, we, that you walk in and that true faith with, with the Most High in Christ. And this is how people can wonder, like, gosh, why are you so even here? Why are you so... Listen, man, I, I let the peace of God resound and abound in me because I understand anything else is harder. Letting yourself stay in a state of, of, of distress, that's hard. Why? Just let it go. It's real easy. Let it go. It might not seem in this moment, but it's real easy. Let it go. You know how you let it go? You keep pressing toward the mark, like Paul said. That which is behind, you leave behind, and you press toward the mark. You deal with it in the moment. You face it head on, and then you move forward to the next phase. And when it's in your rear view mirror, it'll be gone. And the peace, and, it's, and I'm telling you, you see it in every case. 
and you're going, gosh, I, I, I still don't understand how I got over that. That was a tough time for me when I was going through that. But I'm so at peace with it now. Hey, that's the confidence that we have. That's the peace of God that's inexplainable in us. And I tell you, I'd rather work walk in that. And then, I'm not saying things don't get me upset. I don't get aggravated. I don't get, I feel all those things. But I've gotten so much better in my life because I, I, I let this yoke reside on me as much as I can and not try to resist it. It's much easier than anything else that we got to deal with. It's much easier than anything else that the world got in store. We used to scream black power while Heron was pushed. But at the end of the day, nothing's in vain. IUIC has been given a vision. The tents of Judah has risen. Many has attempted the mission. Minor murmuring, omitting, and missing the mark. Just reading that he had the flame of fire in his eyes gave us the spark. We on Paul's mission. We out on the road, purple and gold, from Mexico, Cuba, Haiti, Ghana, Sierra Leone. 144,000 boots banging, concrete crackling. These are how our men repented at heart. The scriptures is proof. IUIC, we deliver the truth.